Tonight's seminar is the first part in a two-part series on fair use. Uh, the second part will be on Tuesday, May 12th, a week from today, at 3 p.m. in the form of a DG huddle. Uh, DG huddles are online video conferencing sessions uh, that focus on a particular issue, in this case, fair use. Um, our moderator, Ralph Sevish, and Associate Executive Director to Business Affairs, David Foe, will be answering questions and continuing the conversation from tonight. So if you have follow-up questions that maybe didn't get answered here tonight, will be available um, for the DG huddle. If you're interested in signing up for this, you can either find me after the session tonight, or you can email me. I've also got business cards on the front in case you need my email address. And finally, I just want to remind everybody to please silence your cell phones, turn off your electronics. And with that, I will turn everything over to our executive director, Ralph Sash. Thank you, Amy, my wonderful assistant. Um, tonight we're talking about fair use and what does that mean? What does that mean to you specifically? What does it mean generally? And um, do you know it when you see it, uh, like pornography, or is it <clears throat> something else? Uh, is it predictable? Is it something you can prepare for? Is it uh, something you need to be aware of? Uh, yes, we can certainly say that. <laughs> Um, fair use is the topic, and we're going to be talking about it in the sense of uh, defining it, applying it to the theater industry and the issues that arise there. Um, we're going to be looking at a specific uh, case that happened uh, recently and was resolved, and we're going to be talking about recommendations to you about how to prepare yourselves and how to address this issue as you go forward in your careers. So. To do that, we've invited some folks here tonight who kindly uh, agreed to show up. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, our author, David Ajmi, um, his credits are in your program, but the one for the, for the purposes of this evening that you should be aware of is the play 3C. Um, also, a, a, a soon to be graduate of the New Dramatists uh, program. Um, and his agent, Scott Shiloff from William Morris, uh, who represents a number of other well-known uh, playwrights and will talk to us also about that, this issue from the perspective of the agent and the issues involved with that. Um, Halil Parnas is an attorney in private practice uh, who's been involved in many of these kinds of cases and issues, who's uh, uh, currently, uh, you, you have your own practice now? I do. Okay. And, um, does litigation and has litigated in this area. Um, and you were with Warner Music. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, is an adjunct at Columbia Law School. And me, you know who I am. So let's, uh, let's talk about fair use. Um, hello, could you start the ball rolling for us and just give us sort of a broad definition of, of what that is and what it, where it comes from? Sure, sure. So under the um, U.S. Copyright Act, enacted in 1976, um, Congress formalized a defense to copyright, which we refer to as fair use. Um, and the instructions from the Copyright Act are that there are a set of non-exhaustive factors to be applied to figure out if the use that you've made of a copyrighted work that would otherwise be copyright infringement should be excused because it's fair. And what the Act says is, uh, it says, for purposes such as, and again, such as is a non-exhaustive kind of term, <coughs> criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship, or research. Um, and then it gives the four factors, which are, and we're going to be talking about those, the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or is nonprofit educational purposes. Number two, the nature of the copyrighted work. Number three, the amount and substanti substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole, meaning how much you took. And number four, the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. What have you done financially um, to possibly harm the original copyright holder? Um, and on the first factor, to often the, the first factor and the fourth are the most important. The first being uh, purpose and character, and the fourth being the um, effect on the marketplace. Um, and when it comes to the first factor, 
1994, the U.S. Supreme Court um, had a case called Campbell v. A. Cup Rose Music, which was about a song parody of Pretty Woman. And the question was, um, did the parodist um, transform the original into something new, or should they uh, go down for copyright infringement? And in addressing that case, the court talked about the four factors and specifically talked about the first one and talked about the concept of transformativeness, that if the um, appropriator has transformed it, has transformed the original into something new, that goes a long way towards saying it should be fair. And the way the court phrased it um, was the more transformative the new work, the less will be the significance of other factors like commercialism that may weigh against a finding of fair use. Meaning, even if you are uh, making a commercial use of it, and in this context, I know you all hope to make commercial use of things, um, even if you're making commercial use of it, that doesn't mean you're not allowed to do it as long as you've uh, somehow made a fair use. And often courts will focus on transformative. Um, in uh, to sort of to the obverse, the court also said, um, that we also agree with the Court of Appeals that whether a substantial portion of the infringing work was copied verbatim from the copyrighted work is a relevant question, or it may reveal a dearth of transformative character or purpose under the first factor, or a greater likelihood of market harm under the fourth. So at the same time, it's saying the more transformative it is, the more you've changed it, the better, but also the more you appropriate, the more you take whole cloth, um, the more danger you're in of being uh, told that you're not transformative that you've appropriated the marketplace of the original work um, and that you've not changed it enough, that it's not fair to allow you to do that. So, and uh, I'll stop in a second, but uh, a very good example would be um, if you think about book reviews, right? Every book review uh, in the newspaper usually will quote a line or two from the book, okay? That is technically copyright infringement. Somebody else wrote that and I'm copying it without the permission of the author or I don't need the permission of the author. Um, the defense is fair use, right? Writing this one line from the book, copying it over, is not going to harm the marketplace for the book. Um, ironically, if I write a review that says the book was bad, that <laughs> might harm the marketplace <laughs> for the book, but that's perfectly allowed. But the appropriation itself is not going to have any impact. And you take the minimal amount possible to get your point across. So if your point is, this author has a wonderful writing style, here's one sentence as an example <coughs> of it. Um, or alternatively, this writer has a terrible writing style. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same analysis. It should be the same. And then films, you know, you see film criticism right. showing clips of the film, and that's under that doctrine. Right. They're only really allowed to do that. You can imagine if they tried to get permission to use a film clip to give it a bad review, how likely the movie studio would be right. to give that permission. Right. Seems right, but there have been cases where if you lift a chapter out of a book, that's too much. That's not going to be fair because the chapter can actually supplant the need to go buy the book, whereas the book review is not going to supplant that need. We can talk about de minimis in a little bit. Yeah. I do want to take a step back, though, first, um, from the four factors to ask, uh, to, to address the larger question, which is, why is this obsession part of our law? Why at all? You know, uh, copyright is an exclusive right to control a certain amount of expression. Um, so under the U.S. Constitution, you have the Copyright Clause under Section 8, which says Congress will have the right to uh, promote the progress of the, of the arts and sciences uh, by securing for limited periods of time, we can talk about that issue in a little while, but for limited periods of time um, to authors the exclusive right to their respective writings. That's the writer part of it. There's another part about science. For our purposes, that's the part of the constitutional clause that copyright law comes from. But there's another part of the Constitution, that's the First Amendment, which says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or freedom of the press. Well, how do you reconcile these two conflicting con constitutional provisions? There's the right to have exclusive ownership over this amount of speech, and how does, co how does Congress do that when they have no right to restrict speech and freedom of the press. Well, the reconciliation is fair use. Fair use is the safety valve, the First Amendment safety valve of the copyright law. It says, well, you have exclusive right except under certain circumstances, which we think are of public importance, criticism, 
commonplace education um, with the, the purposes that are outlined in the law. And so to understand fair use, you have to understand where it's coming from. It's coming from a social good. It's coming from this notion of reconciling two constitutional values, freedom of expression and ownership of property. And the reconciliation of that is fair use. So um, let's, uh, so you've got these four factors that Hillel was talking about. You've got the purpose and character of the use. What, how are you using it? Um, the nature of the work, what work are you using? Is it, a, is it a biography? Biographies have what they call a thin level of copyright protection. Because you can't copyright facts. You can only copyright expression about those facts. So how do you want to copyright in a biography? Well, biographies have text aside from the facts. They have structure. They have a way of telling the story. And those elements can be copyrightable. But you can't, co like again, First Amendment, you can't own the facts of the biography, only the expression of it. Um, you have the nature of the copyrighted work. Uh, so, so you have the purpose of the work, the purpose of use, and the nature of the work. And you have how much. How much can I take? As Hillel was saying, you can't take everything. Is there a certain number of words you can take? People use rules of thumb like that all the time. I hear 300 words, or it's all nonsense. It's all uh, people reading tea leaves. You know, um, you you know if you have had a fair use or not when the ha when the judge drops the gavel <laughs> and says whether or not you're liable. Well, there's a ca there's a case going on right now involving Madonna and the song Vogue, and uh, the and it's happening now. It's happening right now. I'll, I'll, get, I'll explain why in a second. What are we doing here? And, <laughs> and the, the allegation is that the horn blast, if you think of the song in your head, there's like a horn blast that comes in throughout the song, that that note was lifted from another song. And they, the reason it's happening now is that they say until computer technology allowed them to realize it, they couldn't prove that that note was lifted from a song in the 70s or 60s. Um, and the case is about one note. So the Pharaoh Williams and the Pharaoh. And the blurred lines. The blurred lines. Right, blurred lines happening also, right. Um, th there's a famous case, the uh, Joe Ford case, which happened when uh, Ford, after he, uh, he was writing his autobiography, and uh, a newspaper was putting out, a, put out 300 words out of a 500-page book just about why he pardoned Nixon. That was the only part they took. It, it would be de minimis, or only a little bit, under most, if you were just weighing how many words of the total, it's a tiny percentage. But the court said, no, that's not a fair use because you took the heart of the work. The only reason anybody cares about your presidency story <laughs> is because they want to know why you did this. And if you co-opt their market by publishing that information before the book comes out without permission, that's not a fair use. So de minimis, how much of the work, it really depends. It's a very fact-specific kind of an analysis. You can't say, well, I'm safe if I use 300 words, but if I use 400, I'll be okay. And by the way, just to further confuse everything, um, as technology and society continues to change, so in that case, there was no internet, right? So if the newspaper hadn't published those 300 words, they would not have been widely disseminated. But if some kid photocopies the page and puts it up on the internet then so today, then suddenly it is. Mm -hmm. And the question is, does that change the calculus? Right? Does, the, does the easy access to information change things or not? Some judges seem to think it does, some don't, um, which you know, just makes it more interesting. And that, that ties into the fourth factor that Alex was talking about, the, the impact of the use on the market for the original work. Um, if we look at satire and parody, um, you would think, well, don't, if you make fun of something, isn't that harming the, uh, the market for the work? You're, you're, you're talking about it, you're disparaging it in a sense. Well, the, the courts say that that's not the kind of harm they're talking about. We want people to be able to, cr to criticize <laughs> other things. It's part of our First Amendment tradition. It's part of creative speech that we want to encourage, not discourage, by allowing the corporations to own the right to stop you from talking about their product. Or their work. So when you talk about harm to in the market, that they're not talking about harm to reputation. They're talking about are are you going to supplant the original in the marketplace? 
for somebody by your thing instead of the other thing. Um, so that's a very different kind of an analysis. Um, but we're talking about all this in the abstract, and we have a very specific situation here to talk about, because we have the Civil Rights Brigade just sitting right there. So let's make them tell, tell us what happened. Um, in, your, in the case of your play, David, um, when was the first, when you first submitted it, did you talk to Scott about this play before you started looking for producers? Well, at that, the time that I submitted the play, Scott wasn't my agent, I had a different agent. Uh, we never really had this kind of conversation. Uh, I did a workshop of the play with Playwrights Horizons and Club Thumb. Uh, and, and, you know, they co-produced a workshop of the play. And there was um, an independent producer who had just done another play of mine who wanted to uh, do it. So we just sort of um, circumvented the whole submission process. I never really submitted the play. And, um, and that's how that happened. But your agent never said, well, this, you're, you're make, you've written a you know, parody of Three's Company and we have an issue here. I think they, yes. I mean, I think he did say something like, oh, you should be careful and blah, 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 and they might shut it down. And we all kind of knew. And um, I had a friend who works for uh, the, the producers who, um, who ended up sending the cease and desist and said, oh, they're fairly litigious and, you know, just, you know, be very low key about it. And we thought, well, it's a 99 seat theater. It's the rattlestick. Who's they're not going to come down. <laughs> yeah. And of course, within, you know, four days, they were there. And we, we were very, very sort of careful, you know, but by the same token, we really did uh, push the envelope because, you know, the production, we really did make the, the decision to have the set look like the Three's Company set, mm -hmm. to, to take the iconography, to take the stock iconography from that show. And, you know, that was a decision that was made with the director and the producers and all of us together decided that we wanted to, um, to use that iconography. Had we not use that iconography, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure what would have happened. I can't say, but we definitely did choose to do that. Was there anyone at the theater at Rattlestick, um, their attorneys who, was, who were, uh, were sending you notes like, don't use their names or? Well, the, pr the producer, um, the lead producer on that show was a woman named Wendy Vanden Heuvel who has a company called Piece by Piece Productions and she uh, showed it to her attorney and they felt we were in, we were okay, but they also said you might, you might, you might get sued. I mean, you can't, you can't stop someone from suing you if they're going to sue you, and um, you can't stop them from sending the cease and desist. So we sort of knew going in, you know, we're going to flirt with this. We're going to see what happens. Wendy really believed in the play. Rattlestick believed in the play. I believe in the play. So we just said, let's just do it anyway. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a side note. I, we often get calls here to go, is, um, if I do this, can I get sued? The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> anybody can sue anybody for anything. The question is, will you win? That's a separate mm -hmm. question. And that has more to do with, do you have the money to fight it? Or can you find good pro bono representation to help you fight it, as in this case? Um, so that often becomes the power of the purse. And you get exactly as much justice as you can afford. That's an issue for another day. Um, but. Let's talk more about the chronology. And so, Scott, were you involved at this point? No, we, uh, David and I started working together after the cease and desist letter, mm -hmm. after the production had closed. Okay. And so, at that point, at the beginning of our working relationship, the issue was how do we extend the future life of this play? How do we get it published? How do we get it licensed in stock and amateur productions, making sure that this one really fascinating piece of work wouldn't be silenced, that mm -hmm. the production at the Rattlestick wouldn't be the be-all, end-all. And so that's where the two of us started working together, was in figuring out, David has you know publication relationships with both TCG and at Samuel French, both of whom wanted to publish the play, mm -hmm. but weren't able to. The play had effectively been hijacked uh, by the cease and desist letter and by sort of this ominous threat of, well, we're gonna get you if you try to do anything, which really wasn't a threat. I mean, it was very real. There was, we knew that, effectively speaking, David couldn't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it became about you know, how do we make sure that this artist's work gets out there? How do we make sure that this play continues to have the rich life it deserves and let other people interpret it and let other people derive meaning from it? And that's where we came in. Uh, and so both Samuel French and TCG were incredibly helpful in giving us ammunition. I, attached to our initial complaint were letters that they had drafted saying, this is why we're unable to publish it. Mm -hmm. uh, David's opposition in this is blocking us from doing this. He can't, you know, he can't provide the proper indemnification. He can't represent mm -hmm. more that he has the full right to move ahead here. So effectively speaking, our hands are tied behind our backs, and we want to license this. Well, because because they wouldn't actually go ahead and sue me. 
They just kept going like this. Okay. You know, like We're they were going to do something and it's going to be bad. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I kept waiting around going, you know, like, you know, it's like a horror film. You're turning the corner mm -hmm. going, when are they going to get me? Right. And, you know, my lawyer, and so what happened was actually prior to this, you know, the wonderful uh, playwright Robbie Bates, John Robin Bates, um, who, um, you know, had heard about the play, called me and said, you know, I can't get, I, I, he missed the play. But he said, I want to read the play. And then he'd heard from his pals what was going on. I think there was like a rumor happening that there was a cease and desist and I couldn't, you know, extend the play. We couldn't do anything with the play. And so um, he actually called the New York Times and said, you have to know about this. And then the, there was a Times article about it. And then Robbie actually wrote, um, <laughs> I mean, he's an incredible person. He wrote a, a sort of a petition and got a, a bunch of people to sign this petition to help me and really help playwrights and artists, theater artists. I, I want to jump in at that point because uh, I talked to, to Robbie about this. He sent the, uh, the letter he was going to send out, the petition, and so he ran it past me for my comments. And this is where I think it's useful to talk about the satire parody dichotomy or distinction. Mm -hmm. um, because in the letter, you know, Robbie's not a lawyer. He doesn't know what the legal significance is of using the word satire versus using the word parody. Mm -hmm. So I directed him to take out satire and to talk about it as parody. Um, and Terrell, could you tell us why that mattered? Um, if I'm reading the, the lead up the right mm -hmm. way, it is because um, you could do two things here, right? You could have used your play to comment on Free Company or you could have used your play to comment on something else, but still use Free Company to get there, um, an if that's where you're going with it. So an example, um, a number of years back, um, after the O.J. Simpson trial, um, Penguin Books was going to publish a parody, maybe, of, <laughs> of the O.J. Simpson trial written in the style of Dr. Seuss. Um, and I forget what it was called, but basically it was a combination of the writing style and illustrations that were clearly evocative of Dr. Seuss. Cat in the Hat. Right, no, well, Cat in the Hat was the original, like, right. and I just don't remember right. um, what it was called. Um, and so, and the court um, blocked the publication of the book, saying that um, the object of their parody was not the same as the, the com that the entity that's being harmed. Meaning, it was making fun of O.J. Simpson at the expense of the cat in the hat, at the expense of Dr. Seuss. Um, and for that reason, the book was not allowed to be published. So in that, take that example, had, had the book been making fun of Dr. Seuss, perhaps it would have been allowed to be published, and that would have been more of a parody. Right. Um, but because it was a satire in that sense, that it was being satirical about Dr. Seuss, but commenting on O.J. Simpson, um, it was not allowed to be published. Yeah, the theory there being you're trading on the the fame and notoriety of Dr. Seuss to make some other unrelated point. You can't do that. Yeah. You know. um, but if you were writing a parody like Two Live Crew, Pretty Woman uh, as a parody, or the play Free C, um, where you're making fun of the thing, then that's a form of social criticism. That's a critique. That's what fair use is about. And so the distinction between satire and parody has a real uh, legal implication that you need to be aware of, even when discussing your work, much less as you're writing it. Although I have to ask, in, in this case, and you did not answer this question. Um, <laughs> um, now I want to answer it. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Somebody could argue that you were not commenting on free company as much as commenting on society, societal norms at the expense of Free's Company. One could make that argument, perhaps somebody made that argument, which would make it more like using Dr. Seuss to make fun of O.J. Simpson. Right, um, but the court also said that, uh, the, the case law also indicates that you don't have to just be making fun of Free's Company, as long as that's part of the purpose that you're right. writing for. You can then expand your target beyond and, and make societal criti criticism related to what reason you're critiquing that particular work. So, you know, in our view, when we wrote our amicus brief, we focused on that aspect of it. So, um, so, so you got your, did the, did the let the cease and desist letter stop the play while it was running? No, what happened, I got the cease and desist on my opening night. <laughs> my, the production manager called me, Kendra, 
And she was like, David, I have to tell you something. <laughs> and I remember I was sitting in a tea place in West Village, and I was like, what? You know? And we didn't know what was going to happen from day to day. And eventually, the producers were in uh, contact with them. I was not in contact with the, um, the producers of the, the play were in contact with the television producers um, who held the rights. And they worked something out where they said, um, you know, we'll let the play, let the play run, it's, uh, but you can't extend it. And then once you're done, David, you have to agree to not um, do the play anymore. At which point I said, um, okay, hold on a second. And then I hung up the whatever, and I started calling around, like, for lawyer help, because mm -hmm. I'm, you know, a playwright. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't have the money to get, I knew I couldn't afford a lawyer. And, um, you know, I just kept trying to reach out to different people, like, could you help me? You know, you, you know, you hear these people, Ameri you know, lawyers for the arts. Okay, hi. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, I, I'm an artist, help me. You know, give me some, you know, no. No one would help me. No one wanted to deal with this. And I must have called on uh, 10 or 15 people, and you know, um, no one really was interested in helping me with this. So I just was feeling really like this is a losing uh, battle. And so I just said, you know, fine, I agree. And I sent them a letter saying I agree um, uh, informally in this email because I didn't know what else I could, could do. And then when Robbie, you know, uh, contacted the Times, I thought Pat Healy was going to do like this little sidebar thing, but it turned out to be <laughs> this Front gigantic. It was this huge article with a huge picture of the play, and I got you know eighty-five thousand texts on my phone that night when I after I saw Sarah Ripley's play, and I was like, oh my god, what's happening? And I started getting. Um, you know, a bunch of uh, pro bono offers, and then I started getting, you know, then the the, uh, the producers from DLT wanted me to um, to send a form. They sent they sent a formal like letter, like sign it right now. Do you know what I mean? And it became much more urgent. Like you have to sign this right away, or we're gonna, you know, do something. And um, so, um, and I said no. Yeah, at that, I think we called you even at that point. Yeah, I think that was in the middle. Like, I was getting, like, a lot of phone calls. Yeah. And I was like, leave me alone. You know, it was really, it was a little, it was intense. Yeah. I did, wasn't expecting that level of engagement. So we had, the Guild had recently created an entity called the Dramatist Legal Defense Fund, which we had just started a few years ago for a number of reasons. One is about, it was mo originally motivated largely because of the uh, claim of directors that they owned a copyright in stage direction which we felt was an, a diminishment of the public domain and, and deprived mm -hmm. audiences and theaters of their ability to stage the plays that they thought they were written. Um, and so, but also we were interested in First Amendment issues and censorship, and we've been involved mm -hmm. in a lot of high school censorship cases. And, um, but it's, it's copyright and First Amendment are the principal areas, and fair use falls squarely within those two issues, and when we, we heard about this, we, we tried to help um, find an attorney, but uh, David was able to find Ed Davis at uh, Davis Tremaine, Davis Wright Tremaine, and we worked with Ed, who, uh, and the, the, the fund create, wrote an amicus brief in support of their um, action, um, largely drafted by David Sproul, my associate executive director, and with my uh, two sons, Jeremy. And um, and so that became part of our mission. But there were people who were very passionate about this because of the implications beyond David's play uh, for youth, for other people who want to be able to uh, exercise First Amendment rights and to have fair use survive because it only continues to exist if people use it. If you don't use it, you lose it. That was a huge part of, I think, why, and let me, if I'm speaking to you correctly here, why we sort of press forward on this thing was the idea that the implications are so much bigger than just this play. You know, we talk about the fourth tenet of fair use, about what effect is this going to have on the marketplace, like the commercial value of it. I mean, David's written an explosive play, right? There is explicit content. There is a lot of really interesting dynamic theatrical stuff that's in this play that is not necessarily going to appeal to small community theaters right. across the country. I mean, this play is about as far from Bye Bye Birdie right. or Hello Dolly or whatever it is as it gets. Right. And so th at no point was this about let's go out there and try to get as much money as we can from the future life of 3C. It was about allowing an artist's work to go out there and be done and interpreted as other people saw fit and that you know, kept this 
this play out there. They kept it alive. I yeah. mean, I really did not want to go to court, actually. I was like, I mean, I even said to you, like, I'm not going to court. Yeah. You know, I just was really, like, the whole thing turned me off. I'm not a litigious person. The whole, I didn't want to tarry with these people anymore. The whole thing made me crazy. And, you know, and there, there was a, definitely a possibility that they could try to sue me for, you know, if they won, what if they did win? Then they, you know, might have to pay their damage, might have to pay their legal fees. I mean, there were, there were all these contingencies. I was very aware of it. And um, I was just, the whole thing made me nervous and kind of freaked me out, but I really did think about it, and I was like, you know what, like, I, I just needed, like, two seconds to really get myself together and think about the implications and, and the ramifications of it for everybody and for me and for the play, you know, but it's, it's kind of a drag because if you don't have pro bono representation and you're a playwright, you know, I would never make from this play a fraction of what the legal costs were ever mm -hmm. if I won, you know, so it's sort of like... <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's a hard thing for for a playwright to know how to, to how to deal with this if you don't have a firestorm around you, right? right. You know, and I think something else to, to be aware of, and I tell this to my clients all the time, you know, whether they're pro bono or not, right? You get past the hurdle, right? You get past the hurdle and say, okay, this case is worth me spending money on, or worth me securing pro bono counsel for. But how much of your life did it occupy? It actually, I time, thought right? it was going to be much more you did. A draining. Okay, yeah. good. Because, re I mean, I, especially when the first thing, when it all erupted in the press and everything, I thought, oh, my God, this is going to, like, it was taking up a lot of bandwidth of my brain. And I was like, I can't only, th I need to write other things. I don't want to just be, and I don't want to only be affiliated with, like, this company in my own life. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I was like, that's not really, like, my, my you know, stock and trade. But, but I, but I, you know, I, in the end, it actually was kind of, I also, like, imagined, you know, like, a Jodie Foster and the accused, I'll be on a stand. You know what I mean? I, I was like, what if you don't know? You know what I mean? I remember when we went that first meeting at Davis Wright Tremaine, you know, they have this absolutely massive, gorgeous conference yeah. room atop this gigantic skyscraper on 50th Street, and we're sitting at this, you know, unbelievably long conference table, and they were preparing me for... Any it number could be this, of different. They could go into your lives. They could hack into you know, depositions you know, and like emails. So, and this yeah, and it was just like I mean, the the, the potential <laughs> could have been I think much more. Sense. And had we lost this summary, is that what it's called? This, yeah. this the first thing that we asked for. I can't remember. Uh, but if we had lost that, I think they could have had discovery, which would have been, then they could have and, you know put me down at the depositions and where were you and why'd you do this and show much show your emails and all that stuff. Which you know that would have been a drag had we had to have done that. And the judge rejected that. So it, but so because of you know the way things were, we were able to sort of skirt through it and get out of it, and it was not so bad. They just exchanged a bunch of really hilarious briefs. You know? I, think the biggest, <laughs> I think the biggest step, the one that was sort of the most inducing, was the first one, yeah. which was to go yeah, ahead and file the claim. Yeah. That yeah. was the thing that was our because we, we going had to, to do be this the ones we to the we had to be the aggressors, so so to speak, because they wouldn't sue. So I was like, they were like, you have to do it to get them to sue. And I was like, all right, I guess we'll do it. You know, mm -hmm. so that was the big moment of are we doing this? We're doing this. Uh, yeah. There's there's a number of ways that the court could have disposed of the case. They, you could have gone to trial and gone through that that whole process. You could have uh, settled the case prior to trial. You can, or the court could have uh, decided the case on summary judgment. That is, after looking at all the pleadings and then all the, the discovery goes on, and uh, and then there's a, you know then there's a motion saying just based on all this discovery, you can you have enough information, court, to, to come to a conclusion. This court uh, had a judgment on the pleadings themselves and said we don't even know need to go to summary. We don't need to go to um, discovery. The pleadings themselves give us all the information we need to decide this case. Um, and so it was like a complete slam dunk at the, in the end, of, the end of the day, but it didn't feel like that when you started this uh, no. trip. <laughs> no, it could have gone anywhere. I mean, right. uh, you know, we, we talked about this earlier. It could have just gone in any direction. The first judge that we had was, was a different judge, and who knows? I mean, if it was that judge adjudicating, it would have been maybe turned out different. You don't know. And that's what's really terrifying part of this process. You have to realize <coughs> if you're talking about fair use, that means you're in court and you're pleading an affirmative defense. You don't want to be there if you can possibly avoid that. So let's talk about steps that writers can take to avoid that and or to deal with it if it does come. Um, can we talk about you know vetting a script? Can we talk? I mean, does, does at William Morris, do you guys do 
readings of scripts to determine if there are issues that should... Yeah, I mean, the, the process of submitting a play to producers or, or nonprofit institutions or whomever, I mean, obviously we read the play before we right. figure out who it is we're going to send it out to and where it makes the, the most sense. You know, as I was saying to you before we started uh, this conversation today, this has not come up a ton in our office mm -hmm. in the last five or so years. Uh, the more pertinent thing is what you were talking about earlier about the minute misuse. Mm -hmm. That's the... Um, that's the thing that comes across our desks most frequently, is if someone wants to quote a line from a movie, or if someone wants to use an excerpt of a song, or mm -hmm. something like that. Generally, that's the stuff that we'll end up getting into the nitty gritty on, but in terms of broad issues like David's, mm -hmm. where we're talking about you know, the entire concept of a play being rooted in, in existing material, that's not something we deal with all that often. Mm -hmm. It's more about figuring out, like you were saying earlier, is it one line, is it 300 words, is it something like that? Uh, the most regular occurrence in our daily practice is music use. Uh, we're finding a sizable chunk of scripts that come across our desk, want to use whether it's a Gershwin song or a Rodgers and Hammerstein song or rap lyrics or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Uh, that's where it gets a little bit tricky. Generally speaking, when you go ahead to that first production, the theater usually takes care of those clearances, mm -hmm. and so there's not a whole lot to worry about. It's when you get into stock and amateur licensing right. is when it gets a little bit trickier right. and figuring out can the playwright live without the use of something? Right. Generally speaking, the easy bandage is a song like, like so and so. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, just for as a matter of, of, of advice for your practice as playwrights, if you write a, um, a, a stage direction in your play that says, and then the song uh, Born to Run comes on the radio in the background, the producer is going to make you pay for that because it's, it's part of your play. But if you write a stage direction that says, and then a song like Born to Run <laughs> comes on the radio, well, you have to be prepared to have a song by Southside Johnny totally. or <laughs> any of the producers or something. But if One of the things that we do when we are going through contracts is that if someone is really adamant about, I had a client use a, a theme from a film, a very notable theme mm -hmm. from a film, and we were doing the, you know, the world premiere contract. One of the things that we put in, in the indemnification language, was literally accept the use of this theme, saying that we're making it the theater's problem right. as opposed to putting the onus right. on the artist. Right. Which is, again, it's a Band-Aid situation, because when it comes, in the case of David's play, to yeah. future life of the play, which is where usually playwrights make the bulk of their income off of plays, right. that's where it gets trickier. Right. So if you put that like word in, then it becomes like a scenic design or a lighting construction or any other stage direction that the, the producer has to pay for. But so yeah, you just have to be willing to not have Born to Run. If that's absolutely fundamentally critical, then you're making it part of your play and you're going to probably need to license that. The, the other question that we come across a lot is people wanting to write about famous figures. Right. That can be tricky. You know, if you want to write a play about Barack Obama, that's one thing. It's when you start writing about his mother mm -hmm. or you start writing about a coach of his in high school or something like that. That's where it starts to get murkier. Yeah, we have a series of articles you guys can look online uh, called The Real Person in Your Play. And it deals with issues of uh, privacy and rights of publicity and defamation and all of those things. Um, fair use is not within that topic, so we're not going to uh, focus on that tonight, but it's out there for you, and if you have questions about that, the, the, the answers are in our materials. Um, let's, but you did mention indemnity. Is that one way through contract that you can protect yourself? Like, um, very often, if, if, if a, let's say a producer says, I want you to, to uh, do a play for me about Barack, about about Barack, Barack Obama. Obama. Yeah. Um, what kind of protection should the playwright have in that contract? I mean, the producer should assume all responsibility contractually mm -hmm. for anything that could potentially come up to the use of Barack Obama, any of his affiliates, right. and anyone connected to him in his life, particularly if the producer's coming to you with the idea. Right. If it's material that, you know, our president cannot be, I shouldn't say this, our, our, generally speaking, you can't copyright our president, right? Mm -hmm. But if someone's coming to you and saying, I would like you to generate mm -hmm. original artistic material in and around this, mm -hmm. then they need to be prepared contractually mm -hmm. to cover all of your bases. I would never let a client get into a commission agreement like that mm -hmm. if the producer wasn't willing to assume those responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And that's just the contract 101, really. Yeah, I mean, I think part of that gets into the Jersey Boys situation. Um, I don't know how much, because that's an ongoing thing, and we really can't talk much about it, but in 
general term for Earl? Do you have anything you can? Um, yeah, well, I could say anything I want about Earl. Okay. <laughs> um, but but in the Jersey Boys, um, well, the, the one I was going to talk about actually was the the Ed Sullivan clip. Oh, okay. Um, which is a good example here. Maybe that just dodges the, okay. the bullet a little bit. But um, in the uh, in the play Jersey Boys. Uh, when it first came out, and probably still, there is a seven-second clip of Ed Sullivan introducing the group before they resume the play, and et cetera. Um, and what's amazing is, and this went all the way up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in California, um, fighting about that seven-second clip, and fighting about whether the seven-second clip, which was exactly the same clip that was on TV, um, was transformed or not. Um, obviously, the clip wasn't changed, so it wasn't transformed in that sense. But, um, and also de minimis comes up, right? You took seven seconds of Ed Sullivan, but the argument was that you took the heart of Ed Sullivan, that the heart of the Ed Sullivan show is Ed Sullivan introducing the acts. Okay. And the counter argument was, no, no, it's just informational. He was telling you who the next act is. There's nothing, there's nothing contextual about that. Um, and amazingly, the court said that the, the play First of all, they, they granted the fair use defense, and they upheld the attorney's fees against the, the plaintiff, um, because the plaintiff had tried something similar in an Elvis case. Um, but amazingly to me, the court, the court said that they imbued it with new meaning, right? So not only is the court able to say these seven seconds didn't harm the original, but the court is also able to say, just in seven seconds, you imbued it with new meaning, just by putting it up on the screen, using it as uh, an informational cue in the play as opposed to what the original purpose was. Um, and I, I just thought that was a very interesting thing to mm -hmm. say there. Um, in terms of Jersey Boys, uh, I guess you're talking about the, you know, their current controversy, especially right. now that it's so popular. Yeah. Um, there, there's yeah, more issues about um, anytime there's material presented by a producer for you to adapt, that producer should be taking on all the obligations and, and indemnifying you from any claims that arise from those materials. The other thing, just jumping off of that, just very practically speaking, is it's your right to ask for a copy of under, the underlying rights agreement. A lot of people don't do that, but that's important, is making sure that the producer actually has all the rights that he claims, he or she claims, that he or she's obtained. Um, and asking from the production council for a copy of that agreement is well within your rights. Yeah, because an indemnity isn't worth very much if the party doesn't have the money to indemnify you. Right. And some producers have talk a good game, but don't have actually the, the, you know, the, the resources to uh, live up to their promises. And if they don't actually have the rights that they're asking you to adapt, you're going to get sued too. And the indemnity is all well and good, but may not be worth very much. If, if incorporating existing material is integral to your play or to your musical, it's worth attempting in the contract negotiation, and not all producers will do this, right. to get the producer to assume as much responsibility as humanly possible. And another thing is insurance, right? Uh, it's called E&O mm -hmm. insurance. Can you, anybody talk to what that is? And, uh, errors and omissions <laughs> insurance. And I could speak to it, but okay. yeah. it's errors and omissions insurance, which would be uh, an extra policy that covers you from these sorts of problems, things you wouldn't necessarily be able to specify, but when something happens where somebody has left something, er, you know, made a mistake or left something out, errors or omissions, um, usually in the area of not securing the rights, then you'd have insurance, an insurance buffer to help cover that sort of thing. Now that kind of insurance is very expensive and you need to, uh, sometimes it's hard to obtain. But I've seen a lot of contracts more and more where authors <coughs> are asking to be named as additional insured mm -hmm. un under those kind of policies when the producer is taking out that kind of insurance. So that's another thing to be aware of as a way of protecting yourself in these gray areas. Um, and, uh, I was going to say also on Jersey Boys, yeah. I mean, uh, just to make things even more complicated, again, that's an example of semi-biographical adaptation. Mm -hmm. So not only do you have a fight about do you have the rights to adapt it into each iteration, mm -hmm. but how much of it is protectable in the first place since it's actually about your people. Right. Um, so that just makes everything even messier goes back to that issue I said where facts are not copyrightable, you right. can't own the facts. Right. In, in the case I was talking about, they actually said, um, you know, it boiled down to um, Ed Sullivan's charisma, and the court says charisma <laughs> is not copyrightable. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it's utterly absent. Right? <laughs> um, in, in, the in 3C, so the court found for, for David, um, 
that the work was protected, parodied, and uh, transformative, and therefore not mainstream. And I think that's where the case is now. There may be some other activities going on in regarding uh, uh, appeals or whatever, but that's the situation of the case at this point. Um, and uh, is there, is, what are you guys doing with the play at this point? Uh, do you have a publishing deal? The good news is TCG will be publishing it. Samuel French will be publishing it. And we should be good to go with theaters across the country and across the world pretty soon. Yeah. Which is great. <laughs> Victory. Um, did anybody else have anything they wanted to Well, I, I can throw in. I mean, from a legal perspective, I'll tell you just from, from reading the decision. Um, the things that jumped out at me, if I'm trying to trying to get in the head of the judge about what was important to the judge, um, and David, you might have different ideas since you're a lot closer to it. Um, but number one, was the fact that tone was changed, right? It's the same setup, it's the same set apparently, um, but it's the same setup, except the entire tone was changed. And there are excerpts in there that show how, uh, and then it's very amusing. The judge um, summarizes eight different episodes of Grease Company in the opinion. Um, that's just a fun, just a fun, <laughs> a fun read. You really went to town. <laughs> yeah, before, well, because I think they had pointed out eight episodes as having elements that were. Because they were literally like, I mean, it was like, at one point, remember the line? Um, Ed sent me a brief, and my lawyer said something like, cooking of an onion is not evidence of cannot be copyrighted or something. Right. It was like they were really, really reaching. Right. We, also, right. we were just saying yeah. before we came out, one of my favorite things in the initial Davis Wright Germain complaint was it's like he, he lets out an existential howl at the void is one at of the, the end of stage the end directions. Of it's something yeah. like that. And then the following line is just, <laughs> that never happened in Grease Company. <laughs> right. But I think the two things that were most salient to the judge uh, were, number one, the entire tone was changed, right? It was, uh, while I'm sure there, there are funny and happy moments to it, maybe, <laughs> um, the judge, in describing it, is, is it presents a much darker story, much darker tone, even though it's the same setup. That was number one. And number two, um, and perhaps most importantly, um, the the male roommate, the Jack Tripper character, who's not named Jack Tripper in your in your play, um, while in Grease Company was pretending to be gay, actually turns out to be gay in the play. Sorry, spoiler alert. If, <laughs> you know, but it's, in, it's in the opinion. Um, <laughs> And, and for that, I think the judge also said that that was a major twist on the original. And if you're, if you're a fan of the original, as we all are, um, you need to know about the, I'm sorry, did you, did you know the original? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were shaking your head. Um, but in, in order for the parody or the satire, or whatever we want to call it, to work, you have to be invested in the original story, which is the male roommate is pretending to be gay in order to, be, uh, to live in that apartment. And the twist on it here is that he actually turns out to be gay, and that's, uh, you know, right, that brings out the social commentary. And I think those two things, just the overall tone and that very specific point, um, to me, in reading the opinion, were the most salient <coughs> things that, that helped get you where you needed to go. Mm -hmm. um, so those are my thoughts. That's my thought there. Also, you mentioned the word heart before. There's a line in there where the judge says that, um, that David appropriated not just the heart, but also all of the appendages. <laughs> um, and even s and that that factor weighed against him because of how much he took, but it was overwhelmed by the other factors, yeah. um, which that should be fair. Yeah. And that goes back to the, this four-factor test. No one factor is meant to be dispositive. They're also not an exhaustive list. They right. are called the four factors, but it says factors including. It doesn't say only these factors. So as a result, uh, the test about transformative use has become sort of the predominant mode in which these cases are discussed. Can you talk a little bit about that, the rise of a transformative use? Sure, sure. There's, and there's a lot of debate about this in, in legal nerd circles. But um, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there are arguments to be, to be made that transformative, it, the word transformative is not in the Copyright Act, but it was introduced by the Supreme Court as a way of understanding the first factor in a particular case. But you don't need to have it. Um, in order to, to find fair use, or you could have something that's transformative and still have it not be fair. Um, uh, a recent example, um, there's a big case going on involving Google Books, um, where Google has decided to roll uh, machines into eight major university libraries and scan all the books and all the collections to make an online database of books. Um, and is infringing all of your copyrights in the process. Right, so, um, and that case has been going on for, for years now. Um, and right now it's up on appeal. 
But um, the judges in those cases, and there are several that have sort of been bundled up, um, so far have found that, that what Google did was fair on the general theory that um, they transformed the books from books into a search engine, into a searchable database. Um, and that's very controversial and I, I think, I personally think questionable. I've written amicus briefs on the other side um, against Google. Um, and I think that's, it's questionable what, whether that lives up to the transformative test that, that the Supreme Court said. Um, and there are a lot of reasons about that. But, but within that, um, there was one uh, amazing line in one of the original, one of the earlier opinions, um, because the two main arguments on Google's side was that it was the search engine argument and also that it expanded the audience for books because it allowed Google to take these printed books where people with, um, with vision problems or blind people, uh, by turning them into a database, you could then make, uh, make them accessible to people. Um, but amazingly, uh, one of the courts said that um, it was transformative because the provision of access for them, meaning for pr uh, print disabled persons, the provision of access for them was not the intended use of the original work, which was enjoyment and use by sighted persons. And therefore, the use was transformative. So the idea of translating a book for the blind transforms it. Um, I personally think that 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 leap was off was off base. Um, There's a technical term for that: hooey. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think a simple a simple counterpoint to that, which I put in in my brief, was that um, you cannot translate a book from English to Spanish and call it transformative, and then sell the Spanish copy, even though every word is different than, um, e and even more so. But that is still a derivative work, and you can talk about this as well. One of the rights of copyright owners under the Copyright Act is the right to make derivative work, the right to make new things derived from your own. Um, and there's some, some invisible line that we don't know exactly where it is between the, uh, the copyright owner's absolute right to make derivative works and the uh, appropriator's right to make fair use works. Because at some point you cross over the line from being a derivation to being mm -hmm. a commentary. And case by case, we're not quite sure where it is. Um, to, uh, if I could, the two examples, uh, two examples, there are many, but that, that jump out is um, there, and both, both of these decisions are cited in your decision, um, that there was a, um, a book written called The Wind Done Gone, which was um, a takeoff on Gone with the Wind, which was still under copyright. Um, and ultimately, the appeals court said that that was fair. Um, that book was written, it was the same series of events that happened in Gone with the Wind, but told from the perspective of one of the slave characters in the book. Um, and therefore, um, the court found that that was fair because it, it changed it, and it provided social commentary, and it, it commented back on the original. Um, Somewhat more recently, um, somebody wrote a sequel to Catcher in the Rye called um, Coming Through the Rye 60 Years Later, which was a 60 year later sequel to, the, to Catcher in the Rye with the same characters, but an entirely new plot and new things happened. Um, and the court there ultimately said that was not fair because all you've done is written a sequel to the original work and the author's arguments that he was commenting on the original and deconstructing the original fell on deaf ears, ultimately fell on deaf ears at the court and the court said that the right to write sequels um, is the absolute right of J.D. Salinger, um, who was refusing to write sequels and refusing to <laughs> license sequels, and, then he, and he went to his grave uh, in the middle of this case, in fact, um, never, um, never allowing it. And so therefore, they said that it's his right not to have sequels to his book. And it's a very fine line to say that that was a sequel versus, uh, and therefore not allowed, therefore derivative work, versus The Wind Undone, uh, was a fair use commentary um, on the original work as well. So, if you if you switch the judges on those cases, do you think the results would change? Um, it's. I, I think all I can say is it's entirely possible that they would have changed. I think if you had changed, you mm -hmm. could change the judges. You could change the court in which the cases get brought, mm -hmm. because courts in New York very often think very differently than courts in California, um, as you might imagine. Um, and, but again, you know, every, judges are people, um, and they come to these situations with their own preconceived notions and their own experience and their own background. Sorry? What is the standard? I, mean, I, I think we're all driving toward, toward a very similar point, which is um, 
All we can do for you today is sensitize you to some of the issues, um, but we certainly can't, certainly in the abstract, we can't tell you, oh, there's a 300 word rule, right? That's not gonna work. Um, and even in any particular case, and this might go back, go down to the sort of practice points later, in any particular case, if you um, take your situation to a lawyer and the lawyer tells you absolutely you're gonna win or absolutely you're gonna lose. Get a new lawyer. <laughs> you know, because um, nobody knows. And it's not because you're right or you're wrong or you, you know, you have the facts on your side, you have the law on your side. It's because you just never know where it's going to end up, in front of whom it's going to end up, and how it's going to play out. Um, and the best you could do is just arm yourself um, as best as possible on the way in. Um, with that, I think, well, I did want to just address one side issue, which is the notion of trademark, fair use of trademark. Um, my assistant, David Pro has done uh, a little bit of reading for this uh, question, and I just wanted, David, if you could just say, you know, what is what is the current standard when people want to mm -hmm. use a trademark in their play? Um, is there a fair use to use it in, you know, sort of what context? Um, well, when Ralph first asked me to look up what the status is for fair use of a trademark, I mean, there, there are, there's one easy test. No, there's nominative fair use, which means if you have a play and you and the character grabs a Snickers from the refrigerator or something, um, Snickers can't sue you. It's just part of the culture that we live in. Or they can sue you. But <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> unlikely to succeed. <laughs> very unlikely to succeed. Um, they would lose more than they would gain by filing that suit. So, uh, so that's called nominative fair use. You're just naming something. You're using the trademark as a shortcut for this source of this good, which is how trademarks are intended. Um, other than that, a fair use, uh, you know, Ralph followed it up with a question. What if you wanted to comment on something? What if you wanted to comment on the Girl Scouts of America? So you're using Girl Scouts of America uh, in your play. And I said, mm -hmm. well, the Girl Scouts of America would sue, and whoever the playwright is uh, would fold under the pressure. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 billionaires on both sides, <laughs> theoretically, <laughs> who would win the lawsuit? So theoretically, you're allowed to use, there is a fair use exception for commentary with trademarks, and you can comment on Walmart, you can comment on uh, Girl, uh, Girl Scouts of America, where you would get into trademark trouble is uh, in merchandising. You couldn't sell a souvenir program with the Walmart uh, uh, logo on it that says, you know, if the name of your play is Walmart Sucks, <laughs> and, and you're using the Walmart logo, that, that would be terrible. But, it, but um, you know, that's if billionaires are on both sides of the equation. And that's the status of this came up in my office today, actually. A client wanted to write a play, or is working on a play right now, set in a very famous fast food chain. Right. And it's currently set in there. A lot of crazy things go down in this one particular franchise. And so that's what we were talking about today is, is it worth using the name of this big fast food chain, or is it worth... Generalize just generalize, you know, can you call it Burger Heaven? Well, right. That is, I think, a chain of, can you call it, I don't know, just, just, is is your Pizza client, Emporium, whatever you want. Is your client a billionaire? Or my client is not oh, a billionaire. My client's a very young playwright. Uh, and ultimately, my advice to him in this case was, if you can live with it otherwise, just avoid the risk. If it's not going to fundamentally alter the intrinsic qualities of your play, it's better to steer clear. A monolith. Do you have a question? Yeah, we're about, I'm yeah. going to throw oh, it out. Sorry. I'm throwing, sorry. we're at the question and answer period. Okay. So unless uh, anybody else wanted to throw anything out before we... Uh, well, I, I had one more okay. thing just to throw in, and, and there's not enough time to go into the details about this. Um, but, and I was saying before that different courts approach these things differently. Um, in the Second Circuit, which is the, the Court of Appeals that takes federal cases from the New York area and several surrounding states, um, and it's where the Google Books case is happening as well. There's a lot of uncertainty um, about transformative use. Um, and one example came up in, a, in a, an arts case um, called Carrie V. Prince, where um, a photographer had a, a book of photographs of Rastafarian people. Um, and the painter, the artist, appropriated the photographs. Um, and made a series of paintings uh, where the photographs or pieces of the photographs were in the works. It was a series of 30 paintings. 
And he, in different paintings, he did different things to the underlying photographs, some more than others. Every painting was different, obviously, but they followed the same theme. Um, and when that went up to the uh, Second Circuit Court of Appeals, the court said that um, 25 out of 30 were fair, but five they sent back to the uh, district court, to the lower court, for that court to determine if those last five were fair. But in doing so, did not give a bright line test, did not say, okay, if they made these many changes, you know, then it's okay. Um, and what was amazing to me was that you get, uh, I have the quote here somewhere, you get, you get um, very, very esteemed judges, um, or multiple judges on this court, saying things like um, that 25 were fair, five were not enough, quote, for us confidently to make a determination. And later they say, we cannot say for sure. So if the judges on the appeals court cannot confidently make a determination, um, it begs the question of whether this sole judge they send it back to is going to be able to make a determination. Um, and then more importantly, I think for all of you, how do you make the determination? How do you figure out which side each of these things falls on? Um, in addition, there's this other brewing issue that came out in this case about um, when you are talking about fair use, when you are talking about commentary, uh, what is the source of that commentary, right? So David clearly had a message that he was trying to convey. Uh, we talked a little bit before about who are you commenting upon and who are you commenting through. But in this particular case, the court was saying, uh, the court noted that the artist there um, said, I didn't have a message, right? He was not coached properly by his attorney. He, he, he said, um, he said, I did not have a message. That's a good artist. And the court said, right, the court said, even though he said under oath he did not have a message, that doesn't matter because it's not about what the artist meant, it's about what it is, right? So it says, how the work in question appears to the reasonable observer. That's the quote. Um, raises all sorts of new questions. Who's the reasonable observer? Um, what do you do in that situation? But what the court there said was that it doesn't matter what the artist intended, because and it works both ways. If the artist intended a message, but did a poor job of it in the eyes of the court or the reasonable observer, then this says that he's not going to get a fair use defense. Or alternatively, if he really didn't have a message and just threw paint against uh, a screen, um, but the observer would see a message in that, then maybe he will get a fair use defense. Um, so it's, it's really interesting and, and fascinating to me, um, especially when advising people at the get-go, right, what do you do? My advice certainly is know what your message is um, and think about that. And when red flags go off, don't keep it to yourself. Make sure, you <laughs> make sure you talk to somebody that you trust about it, whether it's your agent, whether it's an attorney, whether it's, you know, whether it's the guild. Um, don't keep it to yourself, because if you're thinking of it, then certainly someone else is going to think of it down the road. And 99 seat theaters are, every, are on the internet, and therefore discoverable by all. It's all fair game. It's all yes. fair game. Oh, and don't use the internet. <laughs> yeah. So on that, I'll uh, throw it over into questions, and you had one on the trademark. Yeah, I just wondered um, if the satire and parody differential mattered on trademarks as much as it does for, say, you know, a pre-existing television show. I don't know for certain, but it, it certainly tracks that way, that, okay. that, that uh, if you're in incorporating the Walmart trademark to make fun of Burger King, then, then Walmart, I, I don't know if it, I don't, actually it might not. It's, it's unparalleled, there, there, there's a lack of, of parallel. You have to understand, trademark and copyright have very different purposes. Yeah. So I know. And That's so the, the tests around them can be quite different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. I have actually two questions. One about the song, the like the song. Mm -hmm. Okay, could you say like the song for the stage directions but still use the actual song? Sure. Yeah. But then it's, the, okay. it's who pays for it. Then it's who pays for the song. The producer okay. pays for it in that right. case. Just so. wanted to clear that up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, the second part is visuals. Um, and I'm glad you started to bring that up at the end. You wanted to use paintings. That has, let's say it's a European country that owns the paintings or houses the paintings in the museum. But they've circulated the paintings. There are images of the paintings on an internet site. Are you able to use that without securing copyright? So um, it would depend on a lot of things. <laughs> but let's assume the paintings, let's, say, let's assume it's the Mona Lisa. Okay, the Mona Lisa is no longer under copyright. 
I'm pretty sure. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, even though we have a very long copyright period these days, I think, it's, I think it's out of copyright. But the question is, who took the photograph of the Mona Lisa that you're using, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, because if you're using someone else's photograph of the Mona Lisa, uh, arguably that person has rights in the photograph. Uh, they might have very thin rights because all it, all it is is a photograph of the Mona Lisa, but maybe they had maybe they set up the lighting, maybe they took it from a particular angle. Um, so you want to be careful there as well. I have from Getty Images. I right right. I I have a client. I have a client who's in the vacuum cleaner business. And he got a letter um, saying that he had used a photo of dust mites that was under copyright. Um, mm -hmm. And they were threatening to sue him. Um, and it was one of these houses that, that just catalogs all these works. And I looked it up. And yes, they, they had actually registered an electron microscope photo of dust mites. Um, and he had gone on the internet and found a picture of dust mites <coughs> and said, I'm sure it's fine to use a picture of dust mites. And he put it in. Um, but um, it wasn't. So you know, so so these things happen. So on that point, you should check who owns the photograph. But if it's a specific artist, not well known, like you're going to see. Um, right. <laughs> okay, whose um, works have been out in limited ways, and the works, the original works, are owned by an estate in a museum. Right. And then another museum here in the states that showed the artist's work had pictures on the internet to promote an exhibit. That person's work. Right. It's so if you're getting problem. to your, if the work itself is under copyright, mm -hmm. and we can talk more about this after, mm -hmm. I don't want to take the whole thing, yeah. but if the work itself is under copyright, if it's a new work, right, um, then the artist, or the, the owner of the copyright in the work itself is also, also might have something to say. And it may depend on how you use it, right? If it's an incidental background use, you might get away with it. Um, but there's a string of cases that says if you have a poster on the wall in the background, a stage setting, a stage dress, and you don't clear it, you don't pay for it, um, you might be in trouble. So, uh, and you can probably touch this as well. But the, only, the only thing I can think of just in terms of what you're talking about would be what John Logan did with Red, which I do not know the answer to that. Do you? I do not. That was John Logan's play about Red. Yeah, I saw that play. But I don't. I, I, right. We don't represent John. I don't know how that happened. I don't. But you also, just a side note, there's a difference between owning the painting and owning the copyright in the image. You can, you know, the artist sells the physical property and you own the physical property, but you can't make posters of it and sell it because the artist still owns the copyright in that image, even if you own the painting. Right. In this case, the artist is dead, it's the state. Right, right, it's still alive, so life plus it. 70. Is it does tie into a bigger point, though, that I recommend to anybody here, which is if you're going to use existing material, beginning the rights clearance search as early as humanly possible is just, I mean, that's best practice. There's no question. The minute that a client sends me a play before we know where it's going to get produced or who's going to pick it up, generally that's an investigation that begins whether it's a music publisher or an estate or whatever it is. Doing that kind of research from the get-go can save a lot of headaches later. And the, the thing you really want to avoid is retroactive compensation. Yeah. That's the worst. Um, because once something's taken off and it's a, you know, a proven commercial success, then you're coming back and asking for a chunk of it. Right. And for a playwright, that can be a lot of money. Success Particularly if something's taken off and starting an amateur license. But you know, my, my lawyers told me, like, it's really good that you didn't ask for permission. Because they kept saying, why didn't you ask for permission? But if it's fair use, don't have to ask for permission. And if you ask for permission, you're basically conceding on some level, oh, I don't think this is fair use. And that can really right. work against you as well. My so it's really, I mean, yeah, this is life. As a, le as a legal, <laughs> no, I think as a legal matter, I mean, I think the advice was practical in the sense that asking simply puts you on their radar. Um, asking doesn't create liability if there was no liability to begin with. If it was a fair use, it's still a fair use. Um, so there is, it, uh, asking itself doesn't create the liability. I think that the, the, if but there's, it does put you on there. If there's any oh, no. firm line in the standard trots, if you are, if it's different from what David did, which is setting up an entire play in a universe, based off of a universe, or let's say inspired by a universe that already existed, as opposed to including a painting, or including a song, or including Walmart, I think there's a distinction there, which is if you're talking about specific, you know, let's say less substantial inclusions, those are things that you want to get into. That's where you really begin the hunt for who do I need to track down and doing it as soon as humanly possible.
and having an agent that tries to get the producer to take all the responsibility for it. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've written and adapted five plays on John and Abigail Adams and stupidly signed a contract with Harvard University Press who insisted with the contract that I would have to have end notes of every quote in my play. And now I am about to, I want to send this to a, be published. And it's perfectly ridiculous. You know, looking at Bill of Amherst, that uh, had Harvard mm -hmm. University copyright, it's ridiculous. No, no producer no, is going to have all of the end notes in their copy of the script. Is it possible or probable that I can change that stupid contract? Well, contract whether or not the uh, obligation is a sensible one is an issue you should have addressed when you were given the contract. Now that you've signed it, you need to ask an attorney to give you a legal opinion about voiding it or finding other ways to amend yeah. it. But I can't address specific legal issues about your contract that once it's been signed. <clears throat> Um, I wrote about a historical character, and I have about maybe 30 quotes. Some of them might be phrases that I've taken um, from his wife's diaries. They're unpublished, but they're quoted in the bio. Could I possibly, if I was looking to get permission, I mean, I think I, I've been told maybe I should try and get permission. Can sometimes they just give it to you, or, do you, or is it probable I'll have to pay? Sometimes they can. Yeah. It, it depends. Sometimes the underlying rights holder can be excited about I'm the promulgation of the word. I mean, Anne Washburn's play, Mr. Burns, I thought was absolutely fascinating that the folks from The Simpsons loved it. And they, re they actually referenced it. In an episode. Um, yeah. in an episode. I mean, that to me was, I thought that was extraordinary. So there can be happy endings. <laughs> yes, it's just, I think what I, the thrust of this conversation is preparing yourself for the worst case scenario. But yes, you know, if there's one biographer who, you know, had access to this and he or she's the primary source of, you know, this primary source information, they might be enthusiastic about it so long as they're properly, properly credited for it. There's also, having found there's also it the issue about the right of publicity of the wife. Yeah, but I imagine who's not a public they, figure. Anything, whoever owns the diary, though, gets the permission from, right? Not the biographer. Um, probably, yeah, for the original source. But that's your, if you're quoting diaries, not. Uh, I'm quoting diaries. Have you found them through the biography, but. Have you read the diaries as a primary source? No, I have not. Okay, so you're. Where are the diaries located? I think they're written in this one. <laughs> That's an attorney question. <laughs> By the way, none of us are giving legal uh, <laughs> or, 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 agency, no, exactly. or agency advice. Yeah. We just play lawyers on television. Yeah. So you said, or you mentioned that one of the characters in the play was not named the exact same name. None of the, I changed all oh, of their names. So is that kind of like a, a I know you said there are no act, you know, black and white rules, but I've heard, like, don't use the same names, and I've also heard put parody in the like the word parody in the description of your show, does that help you at all, or? Doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt. And then you should always change the names, or can you ever get away with using the same names? Arguably, I your remember case, I you got probably that. could have used the same names, but I, you chose Well, I remember names. there was a play called um, Dog Sees God, mm -hmm. which was a mm -hmm. play that was a deconstruction, of very dark deconstruction of Charlie Brown and the Peanuts. And they did. He did change, and I was in touch with that playwright when this was all going down. And he did change the names, and I think he did work something out eventually. He he figured it out with, um, you know, the the Charles Schultz. Schultz. Yeah, they figured it out. Um, that didn't go to court or anything. But that also was like a way for me to just be like, okay, let me see if I can. I was. I mean, it was torn between like pulling away from the pulling away from the whole Three's Company mm -hmm. thing or trying to like hew to it, you know what I mean? Right. And I think it depends also largely on artistic intent. I mean, there's a big difference between what David was doing with 3C. What's the name of the Fifty Shades? It's called Fifty Shades, the, the Fifty unauthorized Shades. parody yeah, or right, something. Right, right. Yeah. Or when they did the, the two-man Harry Potter thing, yeah. Potted Potter, unauthorized. Mm -hmm. right. you know, that's, that's calling attention to the fact that right. this is a parody, mm -hmm. this is... Right. I mean, my play was a very... I didn't realize that it could meet the standards of parody and be so bleak. Because my play is really <laughs> dark. Mm -hmm. It's not... I mean, it's it's about comedy, but it's not really funny. You know? There's no, like, black and white rule about using a name or not using a name. There, there's none. But, I mean, the place your question is coming from, if you really sort of play it out, is that you're imagining yourself defending your, your play in court, right? right? <laughs> Down the road. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you want to have as many facts on your side 
Yes. And you want to be able to say, I took the absolute <laughs> minimum that I needed mm -hmm. to, um, to get my point across, yes. right? And um, I didn't need the names, so I didn't take the names. Mm -hmm. David felt he didn't need the names, but he needed the sets, right? And he took the set. Um, a judge could have gone. So the director took the set. <laughs> the director took the set. Sorry, somebody took the set. The director, the director, the director, I, I apologize. I didn't read the, uh, the stage directions. Yeah. In the, anyway, point is, um, they took the set. They didn't take the names, mm -hmm. right? They David could took have, the existential howl. I definitely yeah. the existential howl. howl. Um, <laughs> and they the took the fact that there's two women, two women and a man living together. I mean, there's a wacky neighbor, I believe, who's a dark wacky neighbor. Yeah, the um, and then the, uh, the landlord, landlord mm -hmm. right? Um, you went with the, the Ropers, not Mr. Burley. Yeah, right? I wanted to go with the origin. Yeah, the original origin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, in any event. Um, but, you know, at some point, um, and, and the judge essentially did this in coming to the decision that she did, right? She decided that it was, a fair, it was fair because of the message you were trying to convey and that you had appropriated enough to get the message across, but not too much that it supplanted the original. <coughs> It also can be worth it to do a little bit of research, too. I mean, simple Google searches just about the history of the underlying rights holders can be helpful. As some people who control hugely culturally significant entities are more litigious than others, and are historically so. Mm -hmm. And so it can be right. worth your while just to investigate if someone historically is inclined right. to enter into. I have a question about uh, songwriting. You said there are no rules... 300 out of 500. Number of bars. Orders, right. No. Doesn't matter. Uh, songwriting, it said maybe if you use three notes. No. Of an inconsistent no. Brain, no. No. Well, for, we go no. to the first principle, which is anybody can sue you at any time. Okay. 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 For anything. I worked, on, I worked on a show where we wanted to use, the producer wanted to use the Happy Birthday song. No. At the time, people thought it was owned by these two little old ladies in Chapel Hill or something. And... <clears throat> But we, you know, they're just sing we, we, we weren't even singing the whole song. We were like, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. And not even the second, but we said, it's not, I mean, that's the minimum. There's hardly, that's 50% of the song, they said. <laughs> so, <laughs> the number of bars is contextual. Is it, if it's, a, it's contextual. if it's six bars long, well, the three first, bars is a lot. The, well, the first thing to realize, which most people don't, is that that song is under copyright. Um, right. That it was copyrighted in the first place, and it remains. There's under some copyright. dispute about there that. There is now. an ongoing dispute about that, um, as but my, my client Warner Music believes that it's under copyright. Okay. <laughs> uh, I touched a nerve. Uh, no, it's okay, but it's okay. okay. But at that, to say it's not. Uh, and there's a dispute within the case about the lyrics versus the music uh -huh. versus the different versions of the song and the sheet music. It's um, very interesting. But at that um, time, we thought we definitely uh, understood it. We didn't realize it was under. A copyright, and we were told by our attorneys, "Oh, that's we thought that was wrong, public domain." But yeah. no, the, the claim was at the time that it was. So we approached them, and they wanted some obscene amount of money for two lines of the four of the four line song, and so the writers wrote their own happy birthday song, and uh, didn't make a lit of difference. The show lost six to twelve million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been to restaurants that have their own. Happy birthday songs. There you go. Probably because of this very reason. Yeah. 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 Can you speak a little bit about public domain law? The public domain is the reason that copyright law exists. Right. Copyright law was created not to give uh, a class or or um, to give market power to a particular class of bright artists or a corporation. It was created as an incentive mechanism create works that would eventually become available to everyone. The point of copyright is public domain, um, eventually. It, so the, uh, the, cop, the, the period of copyright duration has evolved over the years since the original acts. Um, it is now in the life of the author plus 70 years, which is consistent with European law in this area. Um, Basically, every time Mickey Mouse becomes getting close to public domain, Disney writes a new law that the Congress passes, and they extend the Copyright Act for another. The last one was the Sonny Bono copyright extension of 20 years. It used to be life plus 50, so now it's life plus 70. Um, the, the problem with that is, and you would think as copyright owners, you guys should all be in favor 
of longer and longer protection of your property, which is theoretically great. The problem is it, it creates a diminishment of the public domain. You have less work on which to draw to adapt your work. Much, much of theater, especially in musical theater, but even in, in, a, in, in dramatic writing, is adapted from works that have pre-existed, that, uh, that have influenced mm -hmm. current work. And uh, as the public domain dries up, this is bad for <coughs> artists. It's not good for artists. Um, so, you know, what's good for Disney isn't necessarily good for you. The irony, of course, being that Disney made its empire adapting public domain fairy tales <laughs> yeah. um, and now wants to close the door behind them. Right. So You're covered in most standard playwriting and production contracts by that. Generally speaking, in the representations and warranties uh, section of a contract, it will say, I say, I, you know, I represent and warrant that everything here is original by me, excluding material in the public domain, is almost always the parenthetical. You don't have to warrant about public domain material. How do you find out if something is in the public domain? Well, the Library of Congress Copyright Office will, um, you can do a copyright search mm -hmm. with fairly economically. Um, basically, the rule of thumb in, the, in America at this point is anything before 1923 is in the public domain. Stuff since 23 may be in the public domain if certain technicalities and procedure formal formalities weren't adhered to. In the old days, you used to have to put a little C on it. You used to have to register. You have, there were formal things you needed to do to maintain it. Otherwise, it fell into the public domain. Since the 76 Act, there are no formalities. You have a copyright the day you wrote it down. You're still recommended to register your copyright with the Copyright Office because that's the only way you can actually defend your copyright. And, and there are other benefits to registration, which is very useful to you. So... Uh, but right now it's life plus 70, except you know works prior to 23 are in the public domain in America. The only catch that comes up sometimes is if a studio, a film studio, has done a public domain story, and then you go to reference components of the story. You've got to be careful. That, you know, the word, basically, they're owned by the studio. That someone invented a character that we think is part of the original myth, mm -hmm. but really it was vis-a-vis -vis Warner Brothers. I mean, or a Disney or Universal or whomever. And that... Yeah, you can get murky there. And that's the recent Sherlock Holmes cases. I mean, Sherlock Holmes fell into the public domain. Certain of the, of the early stories did, but not some of the later stories. And if you want to do a Sherlock Holmes story, theoretically you can do one, but you better not take any aspects of Sherlock that were only created later. <laughs> and and, and, and still the protected. estate is vigilant. Vigilant. More questions? I think we stunned them into silence. <laughs> I think the heat has stunned them into silence. Right. Well, any, it, it's seven o'clock, so actually this is perfect time. Were there any delays on your on your? Thank your you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 This, uh, I think a victory like for one is like a victory for all. Yes. Yeah. And on that joyous note, thank you for coming, and thank you to our panel. Doing. I'm working with an historic 